So, dear posthumans, I'm very, very excited to introduce you to a great uh, scholar of our age, Professor Kevin Lagrandeur. Uh, Kevin Lagrandeur is not only a main uh, voice in the field of posthuman studies in relation to literature and ethics, but he's also a great uh, friend, a colleague, and he's a co-founder of the New York Posthuman Research Group. Uh, the uh, doctor and professor Kevin Lagrandeur uh, teaches at the New York Institute of Technology here, at, uh, here in New York City, uh, where he specializes in technology and culture. He's also a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology and a co-founder, as I mentioned before, of the New York Posthuman Research Group. Dr. Lagrandeur has written many articles and conferences and presentations on digital culture. Specifically with Kevin, we are going to uh, talk about artificial intelligence and ethics, technology and human integration, and also specifically uh, digital culture. Mm? So we're going to have three conversations on these three main topics. I would also like to mention that he's not only a very renowned scholar, but also uh, he has been uh, writing for uh, um, popular publications such as uh, USA Today. Now, in this uh, first conversation, we're going to um, specifically talk about a book which I highly recommend for anyone interested in literature and artificial intelligence, which is Androids and Intelligent Networks in Early Modern Literature and Culture, which was, which was published by Rutledge in 2013 and actually got a prize, which is uh, exciting, really uh, something really special to mention. Um, was awarded a 2014 uh, Science Fiction and Technoculture Study Prize. So definitely a great acknowledgement. Um, I should also mention that he wrote another book in 2017 with another very famous philosopher, James Hughes, on the topic of surviving the machine age, intelligent technology and the transformation of human work. We are going to talk about this in our next conversation. So please, um, I would be very, very happy to welcome Kevin Lagrandeur to our conversation on posthumanism. Thank you so much, Kevin, for being here with us today. My pleasure to be here. Awesome. So Kevin, I would like to ask you first uh, um, one of your main works, which actually is about digital, digital culture and let's say kind of the, the roots of posthumanism, the roots of the discussion of technology from ancient society to, uh, to the conversation that is uh, held today. And there are a lot of similarities that you have actually brightly underlined in your first book. So if you don't mind telling us a little more about that. Yeah, I, I think the thing that's important is that there's a sort of precursor to the posthuman. That's what uh, the, this whole topic of my, the undercurrent of my first book is, um, that our preoccupation uh, with technology, with smart technology, extends all the way back to ancient times. Aristotle, in his politics, his treatise called Politics, uh, talks about the possibility of making machines that could do work by themselves and would understand what the master wanted and get the work done. That way, his society wouldn't have to deal with slaves. Not that they didn't think slaves were unethical, but um, some people in Athens did. And also, uh, Aristotle didn't like the fact that slaves were very difficult to take care of. So he dreamt about a lyre that could pluck its, its, uh, its own strings or a weaving loom that could know what to make and make it automatically. And then, so you, there you have two, over 2,000 years ago, people thinking about offloading their work to an intelligent automation. And that, um, my book traces that all the way up through the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and to our time. That's so interesting. Mm. And if you don't mind, I would like to ask you which kind of machine was Aristotle thinking of? Because obviously computers and all this kind of stuff came much, much later on. So which kind of machine he's talking about? Yeah, that's a good question because the science is very different. Exactly. <laughs> in each of those <laughs> like eras. Stone machine. I don't know. <laughs> right. <It's> like <laughs> right. No, yeah, no electricity, yeah. no digital. Um, but but what what they did all the way through, in starting with Aristotle, was thought of of things in terms of the of what they knew. And back in uh, Aristotle's day, they, they were really skilled engineers, um, but they were semi-mythological engineers as well, like Daedalus. Mm -hmm. So he points to Daedalus and some of the inventions Daedalus made. Mm. Um, and to him, Daedalus was alive and, and real. He also points to uh, the Iliad, to Hephaestus and the, the smithy god, who had made um, artificial, artificially intelligent androids they were made of gold and they were female and they waited on him um, and helped him with his, his work. 
So semi-magical, but there's always a little bit of science involved because actually in Aristotle's time there was um, something has been found called the Antikythera mechanism. It was made uh, about 250 BCE by Greek engineers and it was a miniature computer that was hand cranked and all it was so the gears were so well made that it could compute the exact location of every planet in the Greek universe at any given time on any given day and they they used it to predict uh, phases of the moon um, eclipses and when the next Olympics would be that kind of thing so they had some pretty advanced science that a lot of people don't know about. That's so interesting. And how these kind of developments were followed up by people who came later on? Because here we are talking about many centuries before the Common Era. So what happened again, like uh, for instance, during the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, if you can tell us a little more of the development of those ideas. Especially interesting in the Renaissance because they really go back to the Greeks. Yeah, uh, well, Aristotle's work was never completely lost to Western civilization. So all, all of the succeeding generations had access to Aristotle's politics and to the Iliad. And so they saw those same ideas and maybe because of that, maybe not, but most certainly they, they, uh, they did the same kinds of things. Engineering with clockwork mechanisms um, was especially um, a fine point of science all the way through. In fact, the equivalent of our, our rocket scientists back in the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and, and Aristotle's time were really clockmakers. They were the most intelligent, most mathematically gifted people and the best engineers. So um, most of the mechanisms that actually existed that seemed intelligent, could move by themselves, um, like automata, automatic dolls, were clockwork mechanisms. But in the meantime, in literature, the imagination went much further and like Aristotle imagining weaving looms that could weave by themselves, writers imagined much more complex things. Uh, for instance, um, usually with people who are geniuses. So one of the first instances, ironically, was a pope, um, Pope Sylvester, who lived, who served as pope around 1000 AD. He was a polymath and really brilliant. Um, he brought, he studied with um, the Arabs, <clears throat> who were much more ad advanced scientifically then, brought Arab Arabic numerals to Europe, also brought um, the engineering of how to make clocks and organs to Europe. And he, it was so awesome that, that people uh, thought he could do pretty fantastic things. And so people later, a few years after he died, the rumors sprang up that he could make uh, an intelligent talking head out of metal. And, um, and, then, and it would predict uh, the future of what was going to happen and could see things at a distance. So that was one example, but there's this whole stream of, of robotic or proto-robotic creatures stemming from there all the way forward. You know, um, Thomas Aquinas was supposed to have made one, uh, Robert Gross Test, um, the, the great Franciscan scientist and monk, um, um, Friar Bacon, uh, Roger Bacon, and so forth. And, and those stories about those people proliferate all the way through the Renaissance. That's so interesting. <clears throat> and before we go to our current uh, time, uh, I would like to ask you two more uh, steps of this uh, path. Uh, how does the golem, the Jewish golem, uh, enter in the conversation? And also, what about the cart and his idea of machines? So I just wonder how the cart maybe was influenced by Aristotle, if you can tell something about it. So I would ask you these two questions before we go to the now and how all this history has influenced the way that we are actually uh, embracing technology as a society. So let's go first, maybe if you don't mind, to the golem, the cart and then mm -hmm. to us. Yeah, it's interesting that um, the idea of, a, of an intelligent artificial android mm -hmm. Uh, there's a whole line that comes from Aristotle and sort of Western science, but Western science also blended in magic of Kabbalah mm -hmm. and um, also of uh, the humanistic uh, sort of hermetic science. Um, there's this, this quasi-mythical character named Hermes Trismegistus who supposedly lived for a thousand years starting in the time of the ancient Greeks. Anyway, there was an al alchemical text and, um, that came from Western sources Arabic sources actually in the, into the West <clears throat> that had this quasi-magical, quasi-scientific um, information. 
mostly alchemical. And that was brought to Europe uh, from uh, the Arabic countries by people who were translators right around f in the 1400s. At the same time, um, the Judaic Kabbalah was being translated into Latin um, by the Italians mostly, um, Mar uh, Marsilio Ficino. And so those things all melded together right around 1500, Kabbalah, um, Hermetic science, all became very popular, mainly because of Marcirio Ficino mm. and um, <clears throat> Pico della Mirandola and uh, those folks. So all of that came together right around 1500, and, uh, and then people started learning about stories that had started in the Middle Ages about the golem, uh, and then that also of, of the homunculus from Hermetic Science and the golem from Judaic Kabbalah. So the golem was an artificial android that was made um, by a very adept rabbi with his assistants in the middle of the night, usually near a river. They would make a man out of, a, uh, out of dirt, out of earth, imitating God's creation. And then they would walk around it uh, reciting the secret names of God in Hebrew. <clears throat> and supposedly you'd have an animated human humanoid that would come alive and it could be used as a, as a servant. The key thing that, that my book talks about is the thing that unites all of these androids mm. is their slave potential. Exactly, which I also want to that talk about. That leads to the modern time. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Before we go there, I also want to keep track of time because I, we try to keep it to 20 minutes. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. And what about Descartes before we go to, to the now? What about Descartes and his idea of machines? Yeah, Descartes had an interesting idea of mechanism. Well, he had a mechanistic idea of the universe that uh, uh, that we're all sort of uh, meat machines, mm. but we have a soul, whereas nothing else does. All the other moving organic creatures around us lack a soul. We have the soul, but we're still a mechanism. And he makes a point in his one of his discourses that if I saw you walking down the street, how would I know if you're a human being or just an automaton? Because mm -hmm. by his time, there were some really good automata mm -hmm. being built. So. He doesn't think of it in terms of servitude, but um, along the lines, most of the time, the idea of making smart, mechanistic servants was an undercurrent. And we've always been fascinated by that. I think it, I have the theory that it's an archetype that's sort of built into us, into our dreams of existence, all the way back to the beginning of having some other intelligent thing we can offload our chores to. Slaves are the, were the usual result of that, but I think people always felt uncomfortable about that at some level. And so now in our era, we've invented artificial slaves that can actually do that. Exactly. And this <clears throat> is uh, the perfect way to um, end this conversation. We still have a couple of minutes and then we go to the next one. But this is a, a topic that I think it's very, very important. And I personally think that it's um, not the way to address artificial intelligence is not as uh, digital slaves or artificial slaves, although it's very current in our society to say that robots are good to take, <coughs> you know, like to, to do what we don't want to do. So again, uh, I would also address that in ethical terms. But do you think that this way to look at uh, artificial intelligence, to look at machines from the very beginning, constructed this idea that we now have of, again, uh, artificial slaves or uh, digital slaves, the idea that machines are okay as much as, as they do what they, we don't want to do and as much as they, as they don't take over. So this idea of the fear of AI takeover is because the slave now is rebelling. And I personally, as a post-humanist, I'm very much against this idea of seeing the robots as the other. I don't want a robot slave because I don't believe in slavery at all. But it's very common. So this idea uh, of our society, yes, we should embrace robots, but as much as they are going to be lower than us, doing what we don't want to do, and uh, never ever take over the human supremacy. So how do you feel about this uh, uh, history of, uh, of ideas really mm. uh, um, nourishing this uh, current idea of uh, AI as the other, AI as the digital slave? Yeah, that's a persistent idea in my book and in a lot of the um, articles I've published is that we have a simultaneous fascination mm. with our own innovations and our innovative abilities and a fear of it at the same mm. time because we are like children with huge brains. We make these, these innovations that could kill us, the nuclear bomb, for instance, and, and now, you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, right now, there's a lot of hysteria about 
Um, you know, we're going to create a Terminator scenario where we'll, we'll make an ascension AI that'll kill us all. That's highly unlikely, according to all of the computer scientists I've talked with. Um, very unlikely that we're going to sentient um, artificial intelligence either. So for that reason, I mean, my Roomba vacuum cleaner, which is my robotic vacuum cleaner, we have two. I don't feel guilty having them clean my house because they don't, they don't have feelings. They're not conscious. conscious. Um, if the unlikely event happened that we did come up somehow with sentient artificial intelligence, and there are avenues that are theoretically possible that could happen, then we'd have a real dilemma because for all, despite what you say, that is the way we use robots and the reason we invented them is to offload chores to, um, I don't want to vacuum my house, my, especially with the cat litter on the floor, so my robot does it and I don't have to touch the stuff. Um, but there is that deep fear uh, along with the fascination that runs through all the way through history that our slaves will become our master, the, the Hegelian dialectic. Yeah, exactly. um, and that if we offload chores that are too important and take brain power, um, we would be offloading stuff that was too important and would ultimately give too much power to another intelligence that could then realize, hey, wh why am I a slave? I have all the power, and then enslave us. That's, that is the, a big fear. It comes out a lot in sci-fi movies. And I think the real lesson there is it makes us think about how we treat each other as other living things. First of all, Kevin, I would like to thank you for this incredible conversation. This was our first uh, interaction uh, conversation with Kevin Lagrandeur. Now you know why he's one of the leading voices. His knowledge is extremely uh, inspiring for all of us. Um, the first topic, again, was digital culture in the pre-modern times. Again, this is something very specific that Kevin has developed uh, in this field. Now, in the next conversation, we are going to talk more specifically about uh, artificial intelligence and ethics in our core world, specifically about technological unemployment, which is a very hot topic nowadays. So first of all, thank you so much, Kevin Lagrander, for being here with us. And thank all of you so much for listening to us. And we're going to go to our next conversation. <laughs>